This magnificent building is a small part of a much larger Tudor construction put up by William, first Lord Sands, who was Henry VIII's Lord Chamberlain. As we walk across this immense expanse of lawn, originally this was covered in a series of Tudor courtyards. Can you believe that? Standing testament to the immense changes that 500 years of history have wrought. Here in the chapel, these stained glass windows are impressive, not just because of their splendor, but also because they're extraordinarily old. This stained glass portrait of Henry VIII serves as a reminder of when this place was the powerhouse of a Tudor courtier, a man who entertained the king here personally no less than three times. To the left, there's a scene showing his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. And what's going on up above? Well, this is the moment of the resurrection. Tremendous drama, spectators being flung to the ground in amazement. The centre panel depicts the crucifixion above Henry. It shows him as a young king in his 20s, before he became all gross and corpulent. And over here on the right, we've got a scene where our Lord, carrying the cross and wearing a brilliant purple robe, is about to encounter St. Veronica on his way up Calvary. And underneath, to finish the series of stained glass windows, we have Margaret, Queen of Scotland, and Henry VIII's sister. And she is attended by St. Margaret with her emblematic dragon. I rather like that dragon, don't you? That great green slimy colour. Of course, the dragon didn't get on too well with St. Margaret. He tried to swallow her. But as she was carrying a cross at the time, he found her difficult to digest. So he regurgitated her. What is extraordinary? course is the survival of this religious glass in the first place because in the Reformation this stuff was smashed up and removed piecemeal but I guess because there are so many references to Henry VIII and his family here it was allowed to survive <laughs> nothing short of a miracle but that's not the only decorative art item that's interesting that survived here in the chapel here truly is a pew end fit for a king. The foliage is reticulated and the finial itself is this most extraordinary fellow. He's on his knees, he's extended his hand and is gripping his toe very tightly. He's got a bulging codpiece. But the most extraordinary feature, I think, is the way that he's jamming into his mouth some fingers and seems to be wrenching at his jaw. Most peculiar. The question today is, will our teams be sitting pretty or will they be biting their nails over at the auction? The vine was built in the 16th century for Lord Sands, Old Henry VIII's Lord Chamberlain. It then became home to the Shute family for 300 years and has always been at the cutting edge of changes in British country house architecture and interior design. Just look at this. Between 1769 and 1771, John Shute, owner of the vine, seriously set about improving the architectural interior. As so often happened with the melody of that period, he went off to Italy on his grand tour. Some of these tours could last for five, six, seven years. 
And what the young blades did was to absorb all the architectural detail that they possibly could and then introduced it in later alterations to their houses at home. This staircase hall was a long time in gestation after he got back from his grand tour. But in the end, he came up with this design, which has been referred to as the Grecian Theatric. What he's cleverly done is to take a space that's only 18 feet by 44 feet and has stretched it architecturally to deceive the eye, effectively making it much grander than it actually is. And at the bottom of the stairs, quite appropriately, we've got two white marble busts. This one of Antonius would ordinarily have sat in a niche like that. But because it sits at the bottom of the stairs, the sculptor has especially carved the back side of it with an elaborate shell so that it looks almost as good going up as it does coming down. Just a step away from the staircase is another part of the house that reflects changing taste over the years. Here in the Stone Hall, there are lots of illustrations which take us through the ages of this extraordinary house. The space itself was constructed in the 1520s and has variously been described as the Stone Gallery, the Stone Hall, the Orangery, and in this watercolour, which was painted by Elizabeth Shute in the 1870s, we see it turned over as a family room. Dominated in the foreground with a rocking horse, I particularly like the badminton net which has been strung across the room. And in various places dotted about, you can see the same pieces of classical sculpture which are neatly arranged in the room. Charming, isn't it? But what's going on in the Stone Hall today? Well, the National Trust have decided that the marble centre flooring surface needs restoring. So, Clifton Restoration Unit have leapt to the fore and are repairing the grouting and sorting out loose pieces in the background. But here, we've got an interesting discovery. Now, Karen, what exactly are you up to? Well, obviously when the stone slab was removed, it was an ideal opportunity to see if there was anything underneath that. And um, we've actually found an earlier floor. So we've got um, about five or six floor tiles. We're not quite sure how old, could be Tudor. And underneath, we have got some earlier brickwork as well. Brilliant. Well, I won't interrupt your work <laughs> anymore. The big question today is, of course, for our teams over at the auction. What is about to be revealed? <laughs> This is the Vine in Hampshire, a beautiful 16th century house that's undergone significant changes since it was first built. What we see today is only a fragment of a much larger Tudor house created by William, first Lord Sands, Lord Chamberlain to Henry VIII. The estate was later owned by the Shoup family from 1653 until recent times and it houses a wonderful collection of treasures. If you wanted to record something accurately before the days of photography, your only option was to paint it or draw it. Wigget Shoot, who moved here in the 1840s, wanted the place to be as much as possible a family home. His wife, Martha, was an amateur artist. And what we've got here is a watercolour that she painted of the arrangement of the room in about 1860. And it remains remarkably similar. The piano, which at that time was by the window, is now situated here. It's a rosewood cased, broad wood, repetitive patent piano, which at the time was the absolute Rolls Royce of pianos. Other features in the room that we can see in the watercolour include this gorgeous white marble fireplace surround. As so often happens, with the focal point in the room about a fireplace, you find hanging above it the most important painting in the room. And what a cracker it is. This is a landscape overmantel painting. That means it's long and rectangular. 
It's by Johann Heinrich Muntz, and strangely enough, he stayed here for six months in 1755. So there's every chance that he painted this picture for this particular location. What I love about it is, is that it's so much a grand tour picture, a fantasy view of the Colosseum. In the foreground, we've got these peasants wandering along with their goats and donkeys, having a bit of a chat by a ruin. But this is a fantasy. It's not a real view. It simply sums up a lovely, warm Italian afternoon. Just the job to jolly you up on a wet, grey, cold Hampshire morning. Next door to the fireplace, we've got a piece of furniture. Look at the watercolour. What does the piece of furniture look like in the watercolour? A Chinese export work table, which is what we've got here. Except that in those days, it had a red silk bag, not a dirty brown one, which is what we've got today. <laughs> and to complete the picture, literally, there's another drawing of the room, again by Martha, showing it from this end in the opposite perspective. And on the end wall, there's a balding gentleman shown in a portrait, which is still here, and a gentleman that looks exactly like him, seated in front of the fire. Ah, Wigget, shoot. The big question today is, of course, for our teams over at the auction, are they going to eat, shoot and leave with a big profit? <laughs> This magnificent house, the Vine, dates back to Tudor times. Much of the building has changed architecturally over the years and it now houses a wonderful assortment of treasures that reflect its various previous owners. The flamboyant John Shute inherited the Vine in the 18th century. He was an architect, an art connoisseur, and also a friend of Horace Walpole, son of Britain's first Prime Minister, Sir Robert Walpole. I think you would be excused were you to walk past 16 of these plates and not think very much of them. But if you look at the decoration, it begins to get a bit special. The view that you see is the view that Canaletto painted of the Doge's Palace across the Grand Canal. And when Shute visited Venice on his grand tour, he ordered, alongside Horace Walpole and his friend Lord Lincoln, a set of 24 of these plates, of which 16 survive. If I'm very careful, I'll pick them up and we'll have a little look underneath. Firstly, you note how incredibly white they are. Secondly, you note how incredibly thin they are, just like bits of porcelain except they're not made of porcelain, they're made of glass. That ground down mark on the back is the Pontial mark. And these plates came from the island of Murano and they're called milk glass, latticino glass. Interesting, isn't it? And you just can't believe that on the same grand tour trip, our John Shute bought, in addition to his plain white plates, this, <laughs> the most elaborate of Italian works of art. This thing would have had no practical purpose whatsoever. It was simply made to impress. Pietra dura, or hard stones, is the form of decoration. The pietra dura used on this table cabinet is all of a slightly alto relievo form. That means if you were to rub your finger over it, there are bits of it that stand proud. The fruits and flowers are all stylized, but each one is a different variegated semi-precious stone that has to be cut, shaped, 
and formed in relief and then put together like an immensely complicated jigsaw puzzle. In short, the unified design of this thing, together with its complexity and very high quality, make this extremely special. This has to be the most exuberant example of an 18th century Italian work of art. The big question for our teams today is, of course, over at the auction.